Another thing I was fascinated with was First off, oh my goodness, thank you for bringing this world from your work here. Such a thrill to be a part of seeing it in its, in its, uh, brand, new, um, in its brand newness, I guess I'll start there. When we enter the theater, we settle in, and then we hear a kind of eerie sound, and then we hear a couple more eerie sounds, and then a dancer comes out and performs in silence. Could you talk about the choice for, about letting us have a little bit of sound and then letting us really see the dance before they come together? The concept for the beginning of the evening was um, the be like the beginning of a ritual, I suppose. And I just wanted it to feel like molecules, like sort of converging into one area. So, and I'm thinking of the dance and the music uh, as different molecules mm -hmm. that are sort of for shaping and forming in this space. Mm -hmm. So I wanted them to be individual first and then come together it crystallized, sort of. And, and how did it feel for you to start off stage? That, that you're in the house, but we don't see you yet? Well, I mean, first of all, you know, it's fun as a musician to be a modern dancer <laughs> once in a while, <laughs> which feels so much better. I mean, now I think Brooklyn Rider will probably be playing barefoot all the time. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. It's like the stimulation of the nerves or something. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's great. It, it's, it's great to be part of something... Um, where not all the focus is only on you and the music, but you're, you're just part of this bigger thing. Mm -hmm. You live in the dance world, you live in the music world, so how was it to sort of want to give notes to each other on, can we have this over here, or can the musicians do this? I, don't, I feel like so guilty, because you're the easiest person in the world to work with. <laughs> like, I, I would say, sometimes I would take so for granted how easy it was to work with you that I feel like in rehearsal I would just say something like, well, can we cut that or shorten that? And then later I'd be like, wait a second, that's his composition. What am I, <laughs> what am I doing? And we would talk about it later. And, but you put your foot down when you were like, you know what, no, we actually need to have that sound at that time. Like, I don't think you could do this kind of um, thing with someone who you had a, a difficult time working with. So you said it was easy working with me, but it was definitely very easy. I, and I, I sent John these horrible mock-up MP3s that he would listen to where I would attempt to sing in falsetto and imitate what, you know, the range that Shara would sing in. And the poor dancers had to listen to that over and over again in the studio. I mean, it was horrible. I got to, you know, watch some of the dance being created, which was great and horrifying because I had to hear myself doing that. But this is like, in, this is about three years of work to, to, from conception to t tonight. Mm -hmm. um, not all, at, not the whole time. We are, and the thing is, that everyone is very busy. This particular group of musicians got together for that UNC Chapel Hill show, and Gabe Kahane, the um, the harmonium player and singer wrote a piece for that concert as well. So the musician thing has become a pretty nice close-knit vibe too. But then um, I think it's just, you know, a certain sense like you, you, you trust that you can work with someone and you run with that and you just blindly kind of go into it. But it's based on a feeling that you know it will work. And then you just go for it until it works or it doesn't, you know. Trust really is... It sounds so simple and so something that you could take for granted, but it really is kind of the most important thing. Like if you trust your collaborator, you know, whether your collaborators, whether they're the dancers, the composer, the singers, you know, um, then you, you know that it will be, even if it is a failure, it will be your failure that you have all made together working toward the same goal. <laughs> An audience member I overheard last night, nobody in here, who said at the end of the uh, first act, he said, I really don't like when musicians have their backs to me. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit. I mean, there's a, there's a very different sort of organization of the musicians in space in the first act and the second act. I mean, I think there was a certain sense of what you were looking for mm -hmm. in that formation mm -hmm. that is echoed in the second half mm -hmm. with the dancers around Shara, mm -hmm. but it feels like we are sharing the perspective of the audience while we're playing. So we're actually, we're serving the dance during the first mm -hmm. half mm -hmm. and then 
it changes a bit in the second. But that was John's idea, and I think it was about visually tying the show together in some way. Cher, I want to bring you into the conversation um, because you have sort of an extended version of what, uh, what oh look, you have two microphones. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, of, of Colin's experience that for the whole first act, we mostly can't see you, maybe uh, a glimpse of you uh, through the diamond there, uh, but then the second act, you are so present. Could you talk about what it's like for you first to you know, be in the wings and then to be so center stage, and just that first? It's super fun. Um, <laughs> Because then I could watch Macy the whole time and just really um, concentrate on the music without being concerned about what I look like whilst doing so. Mm -hmm. um, so I really enjoyed the freedom of being able to interact with Macy and to be able to watch the dancers and not be observed myself. You also, Shara, wrote something for the uh, quartet. Could you talk about how that, how that happened? That you, you, uh, so the, the part where she is not singing, she has written what the quartet is playing. So when we did this piece before, it um, in part was uh, uh, at uh, Chapel Hill, uh, UNC, and it was the 100 year anniversary of the Rite of Spring. And so the university asked me um, to write a piece for the quartet that utilized um, or was some kind of um, echo of the Rite of Spring. And so that was the little freedom moment I had. <laughs> So at what point then, John, did you say, I know, now you get out from behind your music stand and start to fly? Two weeks before that show, Shara's piece was a completely separate part of the program, and then we were like, let's put it in Chalk and Soot if it's okay. And because she sings um, so much of the time, we thought, well, what is she going to do? What's going to happen? She hasn't written a singing part for herself in her portion, so she's just, is she going to stand there? And Miley Okamura, who designed the costumes, had designed this fabulous, you know, um, triangular piece with this giant skirt. And Miley had this brilliant idea of like, okay, she has this giant skirt. What if inside the skirt there's this teeny weeny little pencil skirt? And I was like, great. Also because we were running out of time with the creation and your piece is five or six minutes, I guess I would say. So I had six minutes to fill and it takes a lot, it's a lot easier to fill six minutes like this <laughs> than like big strides. So, but we knew we wanted her to have like some kind of dream at, at that portion. The sense we had early on was that a lot of the piece was in some ways Shara's characters dreams or visions or she it's a visionary character and and through her we experience all these different worlds in a way you, you um, use the poems of Kandinsky to come up with the lo the the lyrics that we're hearing or they're inspired by and you can see the libretto in the program I wonder if you could talk about whether you also looked at the images that and how that uh, played a part in um, in the creative process Sure. So the book sounds, the book of poetry, Kandinsky also created some wood, um, wood cuts for it uh, that he included as illustrations in his book. And they are all, they are, they have influenced a little bit of the stage picture. Um, the costumes are very much sort of inspired by these sort of these black and white woodcuts. And some of the scene, we didn't actually take a specific picture and put it on stage, but many of the scenes are pastoral uh, in the written words, but also in the woodcuts, and we certainly did include some of that mm -hmm. stuff. Having seen John's work before, I thought there was some sort of tone in the Kandinsky that would work. Just the, the sort of opening of imagination to strange worlds and strange humor at times seemed like I felt like there was something there that we could, we could work mm -hmm. with. So, I mean, they're, they're funny, they're weird. Sometimes they're really beautiful, I think. And um, it, it just felt like a, a, a good doorway for us to, to walk through in mm -hmm. order to start making something. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we tried to create a historical piece of the Blue Rider group mm -hmm. and Kandinsky in 1910, but it was a great door to open mm -hmm. up and get our imagination mm -hmm. going. Eyes look out from afar, the cloud rises. 
Her face so far the cloud the sword the road Eyes look out from afar the cloud rises The face so far the cloud the sword the road Eyes look out from afar the cloud rises The face so far the cloud the sword the